Hi, I'm Sal McCagliano, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University, a former Merchant Mariner and an instructor in maritime industry policy. Uh, welcome to this special episode of What's Going On With Shipping, our Memorial Day two-part series. This is part one. We're going to talk about how the Merchant Marine, the U.S. Merchant Marine, specifically supports the national security of the United States, specifically national defense. And we're going to look at it through the prism of an organization that most people know nothing to little about, and that is the U.S. Navy's Military Sealift Command. Uh, MSC, the Military Sealift Command, has been around since 1949. It was originally named the Military Sea Transportation Service, but was renamed in 1970 in the midst of the Vietnam War. And since its inception back in 1949, the Military Sealift Command has provided the necessary support, sea lift, transportation, food, fuel, cargo, you name it to not just the US Navy, but the entire Department of Defense. Uh, this is a very unique entity, the Military Seal of Command. And I thought I'd spend this Memorial Day when we commemorate those who have given their lives in the service of the nation by looking at this entity. Uh, during World War I, World War II, and even the Vietnam War, merchant mariners gave their lives in support of the United States. In the case of World War I and World War II, they were nationalized into the US military. They were considered part of the military, even though they were not specifically in it. During the Vietnam War, they were not, even though merchant mariners lost their lives transporting goods to Vietnam. And in the second part of this series, we're going to talk about that for Memorial Day. But today, I thought I'd talk specifically about this, about uh, the Military Sea Lift Command and their role here in in uh, the mil in in supporting the military, uh, a very unique entity by sure by by any means, and. One of the things I want to show is how they fit into this overall structure. So this image here is a poster. I apologize for the quality of it. It doesn't come out very good, but it's the only one I could find online. This is from Raytheon. Every year Raytheon puts out the ships and submarines of the U.S. Navy. You see these posters up on every midshipman's wall at, at, at the U.S. Naval Academy. But it shows, you know, the carriers, the cruisers, the destroyers, the littoral combat ships, subs, amphibs, you name it. Uh, even have the Constitution on there, even have the Pueblo on there, which I always thought was very interesting because she's still considered a commissioned vessel in the U.S. Navy. What's not on this chart and, and missing from this is the auxiliary vessels. Uh, this represents the combat, the shooters element here of the U.S. Navy, but does not include the auxiliaries. And that's provided here. This is the uh, uh, chart of the United States Military Seal of Command. This is the newest one out in 2021. And it shows all the vessels that are in the Military Seal of Command, crewed and manned by merchant mariners. You know, what makes the Military Sea Lift Command such a unique entity and the Merchant Marine such a unique entity? Yes, there are contractors who support the military all the time, but many of these merchant mariners are, number one, in the government employ. They're what's referred to as civil service gov uh, government mariners. In other words, they're employed by the government directly, but uh, some are contract operated through union halls and companies that operate it. But most importantly, many of these vessels are in the unified command structure of the U.S. military. Uh, Contractors don't fit into that. In the Army, there's there's not a contractor who commands a, a brigade. In the Marines, there's not a contractor that, that commands a, a, a unit. In the Air Force, there's not a contractor that commands a squadron. Yet in the U.S. Navy, one out of five ships, 20% of the U.S. Navy is crewed and manned and commanded by merchant mariners. Uh, these include uh, vessels that provide direct fleet replenishment, to the US Navy. This includes vessels that provide direct fleet support, fleet tugs, uh, salvage vessels, support bases, tenders, uh, hospital ships, fast transports, vessels that provide lift for pre-positioning equipment overseas, and also sea lift elements. And so this fleet is a very expansive fleet. And you'll see they're grouped in the three specific areas. One is combat logistics force, the second is fleet support and special mission. And then the third is combatant command support. And we're going to address each of those in detail and talk a little bit, little bit about what each of them do. I'll give you a little background because I always like to give you some background in this and I'll have these in the show notes so you can link over to them. Uh, a couple of elements here, I think they're really important. First off, this article, that which was in the April 2021 United States Naval Proceeding by Nick Lambert, what is a Navy for? Talks specifically about that relationship between the Merchant Marine and the U.S. Navy. As a matter of fact, one of the things that Nick Lambert makes the argument about, and I agree entirely with Nick Lambert, is that one of the key things for a mission of a Navy is to defend its trade. 
commerce. And obviously the merchant marine plays a very instrumental part about that. To be a true sea power, you don't just need military force, you need commercial force. Second, this primer from the Congressional Budget Office, the US military's force structure is great. If you wanna understand how the US military is structured, what it looks like, ships, aircraft, uh, military units, you name it, this is it. It's a great primer on that. Really recommend it to take a look at so you'll understand how it fits, how the military seal of command fits into this structure. Finally, there is obviously the great power fight, which you know looms on the horizon. What do you gear up for? And just as I showed you the US Navy and the military seal of command, here is the Chinese fleet. And the Chinese fleet is the big powerhouse on the world's oceans today. The PLA Navy or the People's Liberation Army Navy, the plan uh, is a big force and getting bigger. Uh, and this chart shows it, not just the, uh, the planned Navy, but their Coast Guard, their Maritime Defense Force, everything on there. Then you also have the Russians out there. While the Russians are not the Soviet Navy by any means, still a powerful force, especially if concentrated together and as a striking force. Uh, and so that is definitely an image that's out there. And again, the U.S. Military Seal of Command fits into the U.S. military, not just the Navy, but the entire Department of Defense structure. So first I thought I'd talk about the personnel makeup of Military Seal of Command. One of the things you get from the force is it's a large entity, 7,967 people working directly for it, plus another 1,400 commercial mariners. These are merchant mariners who are on ships chartered by Military Seal of Command. But one of the things that stands out about this entity and this organization is number one, it is almost entirely civilian. Uh, only a thousand personnel, military active and military reserve, are in directly in the US military. The rest of them are civilians working ashore, 1300, and the large majority of these civil service mariners working afloat. And that's a very interesting entity about the military seal of command. If you look at their command structure, they're commanded by a two-star rear admiral. It's a very Navy heavy organization. A two-star rear admiral commands military seal of command. For most of its history, it had been a three-star that's been reduced recently. Uh, it, the, that, that commander, which right now is Rear Admiral Wetlaufer, uh, has three commanders he reports to. He reports to the four-star general. Uh, right now, it's General Steve Lyons, the U.S. Army at U.S. Transportation Command. He also reports to the U.S. Navy's Fleet Forces Command, and he reports to the Assistant Secretary of the Navy uh, for procurement. So very weird arrangement in that he, he has three bosses. Add to it, the organization is very heavily focused on military officers and senior executives, uh, what's called SESs. There are actually a total of five SESs uh, within it. And the, the, the SESs oversee the branches. What's interesting about the SESs is who oversee this, but I will say this, and I wrote an article for the Center of International Maritime Security on this subject. This is the piece right here. One of the things I made an argument about is, is why military seal of command needs merchant mariners at the helm. While it's great to have this type of organization here, very Navy heavy with, with civilian leadership, which is really good. One of the things that MSC does not do is raise up people from the deck plates to the command structure. For example, masters, chief engineers, the senior officers on board these vessels don't have a command path into the land-based organization. They literally have to leave shipping and sailing and then reapply and sometimes enter at a much lower level than they should. And it, it's a very unique entity. The, the Royal Navy has an entity called the Royal Fleet Auxiliary that is much better structured that, at shifting people from land to shore and back again. Uh, something I think is missing, hence the reason I wrote this article. It really wasn't critical of the specific commander of Military Seal of Command, which was unfortunately the way it was interpreted. It was really a argument about the structure of Military Seal of Command that needs to be reformed to better make it suitable for the future. So the first of three mission areas that MSC has is in its combat logistics forces. And what combat logistics forces are, these are the ships that provide direct support to US Navy vessels deployed. So for example, zoom in here for a, se a second. Here's an image right here of one of MSC's vessels. You can always tell an MSC vessel, by the way, it has this blue and gold stripe on the, on the smokestack. That's the, the stack colors. It's actually black, gray, blue, and, and, and gold but that's how you identify a military seal of command vessel. But right here, you're seeing the USNS, and that's another thing, uh, MSC vessels will be identified not as USS, not United States ship, but United States Naval ship. 
uh, and then their designation USNS Yukon T dash AO 202. The T dash is, is a signifier too that is a military seal of command vessel. So you can always identify that. And one of the things you see here is an underway replenishment. The uh, Yukon there is an oiler, uh, not just a tanker. Tankers carry fuel. The Yukon carries fuel. But what well, you refer to as an oiler is because of these rigs on the side, these, these black hoses that are on these masts right here. This allows you to fly the rigs across and do what's called an underway replenishment. Sail alongside each other about 140 feet apart at about 12 to 13 knots fly the rigs across and start pumping fuel and water across. And, and uh, uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's also equipment too that will go across on it. Uh, there are 15 of these oilers that are in the fleet divided between the Atlantic, the Pacific and out in the Mediterranean and the Persian Gulf. Uh, there's a brand new class coming out, the uh, USNS John Lewis. The John Lewis was recently launched at NASCO in San Diego. That will be the vessel that will start replacing the Kaisers. The Kaisers were entered service in the 1980s and the last ones came in in the mid 1990s. So they're getting a little long in the tooth. Uh, add to it, you have these what's called dry cargo and ammunition ships. This is the Lewis and Clark class vessels. They actually combine together two distinct classes of vessels, ammunition ships and store ships. And you put them together, you took you know, you know part of an ammunition ship, part of a store ship, put it together and made a very big ship, which is the Lewis and Clark class vessel. Uh, big ships, uh, uh, definitely this is an image of one right here coming in alongside. This is the William McLean coming alongside the USS Bataan right there. You get the image of it right there. They can fly rigs also. A lot of them have cargo rigs and they also have helicopters that they can use where they can do vertical replenishment, vert rep, including some of the fact that some of these vessels have commercial helicopters on board, SA-330 Pumas. Uh, they're under contract. This way you're not using always using government helicopters, U.S. Navy helicopters. You have the civilian helicopters that are under contract. Uh, and so the Lewis and Clark provide a, a very important service, providing food, uh, food, limited fuel, and ammunition. And then the last two vessels are these. These are the fast combat support ships. These were former U.S. Navy vessels. Let's go down here and show you an image of it here. These are referred to as AOEs. And here you can see one. This is USNS Supply AOE-6. Uh, these are much faster. So, for example, Lewis and Clark and, and Henry J. Kaiser has a speed of about 20 knots. Supply has a speed of about 24 knots. And she encompasses all fuel, ammunition, everything. She's, she's a one-stop shop for everything. And these vessels are fantastic. They're, they're really great. These are the vessels that if you deploy with a battle group, you only need one vessel. If you supply send a, a battle group, you would need one Kaiser and one Lewis and Clark or one supply. So she does the job of two vessels. Uh, there were four of them, only two left in service. One of them, unfortunately, got a little bit of radiation when it was off of Fukushima. And so it's out of service. The other one was taken out of service also. So there's only two of them. And I think that's a critical mistake. I have to say that. I, I think these vessels provide a unique service that they they are one-stop shopping in many ways and one of the things that has happened over the course of the years during the at the end of the cold war going forward is you would have vessels like the supply for example and its sister ships the sacramento class which have been taken out of service they would be the the, the one vessel supporting the battle group and then the msc vessels the the kaisers and the lewis and clarks would be shuttling between bases to those vessels supplying that keeping them forward now what's happening is these vessels have to supply the battle groups and then go back to the bases and then run back. It puts a lot of wear and tear on the fleet. And so the combat logistics force, which is a very impressive force, I would argue, always argue that the United States Navy's combat logistics force is the premier combat logistics force. The, there's no vessels that provide underway replenishment on the scope and scale of the U.S. Navy. So the next area is a very big and encompassing area. This is the area of fleet support and special missions. So th there's a lot of vessels that kind of fall into this area here and uh, go through some of them here to give you an idea. So in, in the area of special missions, this has been a, a, a trade of military sea lift command since the 50s. Uh, one of the things that happened was the U.S. Navy started to really transfer some of these vessels that do, <coughs> excuse me, very unique missions. So, for example, you got vessels that did range instrumentation. These were missile ships that tracked the launch and test of missiles. When the uh, United States started the uh, manned space program, the, the Mercury, the Gemini, and eventually the Apollo, uh, 
MSTS, MSC vessels were out there in the ocean to set up telemetry and also radio communication. It was an MSC, for example, vessel that communicated with Gemini 8 when uh, uh, Dave Scott and Neil Armstrong started tumbling in the Gemini 8 spacecraft. And they provide that direct communication through the, uh, that vessel. So special missions does a whole variety of things. So for example, there's submarine support vessels. And these vessels are, are very unique. So for example, the, the vessels there, the Black Powder, the West Wind, the Eagle View, and Arrowhead do something that most people don't know much about. So these four vessels provide a very unique service. There's two on the East Coast at Kings Bay, Georgia. The other two are on the West Coast uh, in Bremerton. And those are the sites of the US Navy's ballistic missile submarine bases, the Trident missile submarines. And what you see here is two of those vessels, two of the four escorting out one of those ballistic missile submarines. So typically these submarines were being escorted out by Coast Guard vessels, usually little cutters, 87 footers. The problem they realized is if, if a terrorist large organization wanted to get at these boats, an 87 foot patrol boat wasn't quite big enough for that. So these boats are designed as block boats. They will basically put themselves in the way of any vessel that comes close to it. They're designed to run into vessels. They also have something that's not typically seen on board commercial vessels. Underneath this tarp right here is 25 millimeter chain guns. Uh, these are on the bow and stern of the vessel. They have fittings on here to provide weaponry. They also carry these containers uh, lined up in the center of the vessel there. Uh, from what I have been told, and, and, and basically those provide barriers uh, for uh, uh, shields. Uh, they're basically full of sand and whatever to do basically absorb hits to get between the submarine and any vessel that comes close to it. And they have armed guard detachments, military armed guard detachments. Uh, I'm not sure if they're Navy or Coast Guard on board who provide protection for them. And uh, they serve that escort. You can see that gun right there on the bow there of Eagle View uh, in, in pretty good uh, detail right there. Some of, the vet, some of the images you will not see them on here. Uh, I'm not sure if they've been scrubbed off or not or they weren't fitted at the time. But you'll see them on here. Go back here for a couple of the images back here. Uh, you'll see them coming in. And that's what they're designed to do. They're designed to basically get in the way and provide that kind of bump protection. Uh, again, a very unique service, something you don't typically see uh, mentioned at all. Uh, the other elements they have in here are survey vessels. Survey vessels are very much similar to what NOAA has. The NOAA fleet, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, runs survey vessels, but they run within the coastal waters of the U.S. The U.S. Navy operates these vessels in international waters. Basically, they go out and survey waters, particularly for submarine operations, uh, to, this, to ensure that they know depths and, and water currents and salinity. And all those elements are basically examined in that. Uh, there's a cable layer, the U.S. and the Zeus. She's going to be replaced eventually by a new vessel. The, the Zeus is, is getting a little bit long in the teeth. Uh, but one of the things that she maintains is the Navy's SOSIS array system. Uh, Navy maintains its own underwater cable system. It also, also maintains underwater listening stations. And it basically maintains those cables to the vessels. Very important thing was it was instrumental during the Cold War to track submarines in the middle of the ocean. And that's another example. The uh, SBX-1, which is a large kind of uh, uh, platform with a large dome. This is used, this is an X-band radar platform. It's used to test uh, basically and monitor missile launches, particularly in the Pacific, especially by the Koreans. Uh, this is one of the things they do. Uh, ocean surveillance vessels, victorious, able, effective, loyal, and impeccable. These vessels uh, tow uh, basically uh, uh, arrays, uh, large sonar arrays, either active or passive to detect submarines. They, they basically operate much like a SOSIS system, except they're not fixed in place. They move around. They've also been the target of a lot of harassment by the Chinese over the course of their existence. Uh, those vessels have been targeted time and time again by the Chinese with attempts to cut their arrays. Uh, there's a new, uh, new uh, replacements for them that are also supposed to be coming online in the near future. Finally, you have the prepositioning and sea basing. So prepositioning is a, is, a, is a concept that goes back to the 1980s. Actually, it goes back earlier than that in the 60s. There was a, 
a development of this prior to the Vietnam War. It was curtailed after the Vietnam War. But in the 1980s, the decision was made to start prepositioning equipment afloat, uh, basically because of what happened in Iran in 1979 and the failed relief opera operation at Desert One. And so initially there were three squadrons, one in, in the Atlantic uh, that was forward based in the Mediterranean, one at the Indian Ocean at Diego Garcia, and squadron three was in the Western Pacific and the Marianas at Guam and Saipan. Today they've been boiled down to two squadrons. Uh, the, the first squadron went away in the early 2010s, and now you've got two squadrons. Uh, squadron two is still at Diego Garcia. It's a mix of old legacy MPS, the original MPS, the, the, what we refer to as the Bobo or the AMC class, along with some large medium speed Roros. Uh, there's about five of those vessels. You'll see right here, here's a list of them. There's, there's five of them uh, stationed out there. And then squadron three, which is out in the Western Pacific, actually has uh, more than that because they have a couple of vessels attached to them. They have what they call these ESDs, which are these uh, basically large ramp vessels that the ships can come alongside. They can put their ramps onto them, offload their cargo, and then you can actually drive LCACs, landing uh, craft air cushion onto them and offload uh, very, very impressive platforms. Uh, and that allows you to offload those vessels at anchor. Uh, MPS vessels also have lighterage on board. They have these barges on board, very unique vessels. Uh, the joke with an MPS uh, maritime prepositioning ship is it's one half container ship, one half roll on roll off ship and one half tanker. Uh, and you'll see right there, those barges right alongside there. Let's see if I'll zoom in there a little bit, give you a little better picture there. Those are those landing barges right there. Cranes can offload the containers. They can do this. They can offload. One of these vessels can offload in three days pier side or five days at anchor very very impressive uh, vessels they were used during the first persian gulf war in 1990 again in 2003 uh in in iraq for example so they have a lot of utility uh, the only thing about preposition is it's very expensive it's a very expensive to operate vessels 24 7 you know on standby all the time it's just it's it's a lot of money it's a big huge expense and it's one of the reasons why the marines have curtailed down to two squadrons uh there's also out there too, this expeditionary support bases. Uh, come over to that next. Uh, these are basically big. This is uh, one of them right here. I'll show you the expeditionary support base right here. There you go. Uh, this is very similar to the ESD, the Ex Expeditionary Support Dock, except the Expeditionary Support Base. These are modified Alaska class tankers, super tankers. Uh, uh, they were built out in NASCO in San Diego. Uh, and specifically, uh, the ESBs are these large flight decks, massive, the biggest flight deck in, in the Navy, except for the uh, amphibs and the aircraft carriers. Uh, they also can house large detachments on board, uh, carry these helos, boat units, drones, uh, you UAVs, you name it. Initially, these vessels were going to be USNS vessels. They were going to have civilian crews on board in command. They still have civilian crews on board, except they're USS vessels, meaning they're commanded by a Navy officer, a very unique command structure called a hybrid, where you have a Navy commander, a Navy 06 captain in command, but you still have the merchant marine deck engine and steward on board, along with Navy embarked. And the reason for that was a legal issue. They were very worried that these vessels launch offensive operations that the merchant mariners on board could be construed to be basically pirates uh, operating without proper documentation. I would think there would be privateers, but, but anyway, that was one of the legal arguments. So instead they commissioned the vessels, they made them USS, they still have the civilian crews on board, which I think is a legal issue should these vessels ever come under fire or attack. Uh, for example, the Polar operates in the Persian Gulf all the time. Uh, she's always there. The second one, the, 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 the Herschel Woody Williams is, is, is operating in the Sixth Fleet area. The Miguel Keith, which is the third one, which was just recently co commissioned, will eventually go out into the Seventh Fleet. And then uh, the Canley and the Simonac, the next two, I'm not sure where they're going to go yet. Not exactly sure where they will operate yet, but we'll definitely see them out there. And then the other vessels that are out there are these vessels that do what's called this offshore petroleum discharge system. So how do you get fuel ashore? If you don't have a port, if you got to go over a beach, how do you get fuel ashore? It's very tough to bring that ashore in bladders and tankers. So what the uh, OPDS does is it's a uh, piping system where you actually have a buoy with a hose attached to it. And then one of these vessels lays the pipe all the way to the beach. 
and you basically moor to the buoy and you can pump through that pipe ashore. A very uh, novel system to be able to get fuel ashore. So continuing under this, this banner of fleet support, you have another variety of missions. This includes the two hospital ships, USNS Mercy and USNS Comfort. Uh, now I'm gonna give away a, a favorite of mine here. I sailed on board USNS Comfort. And so obviously she is the best hospital ship out there. Mercy comes in second place. But still, these hospital ships are amazing vessels. Now, they're long in the tooth. They were built in the mid-70s, converted in the mid-80s, uh, steam-powered, uh, big, massive vessels, 894 feet long, 105 foot wide, just big lumbering things, but extensive hospital facilities that have been updated amazingly. Uh, when they're in operation, they're some of the biggest hospitals in the world. Uh, capability with 1,000 beds, 12 fully articulated operating rooms, dental suites, ICUs, you name it. Just, just absolutely massive vessels. And they bring a lot of medical capabilities when they're activated. They're maintained in, in a reduced operating status, comforts in Norfolk, Mercy's in San Diego. And they draw upon the Navy staffs from local hospitals and reservists when activated. Uh, rescue and salvage vessels. So this is a big thing going on right now for the Navy. The Navy's in the process of building new uh, salvage vessels. Eight of them are, are scheduled to be built. Right now, there are three fleet tugs and two salvage vessels still remaining in the fleet. And I think it's a critical shortfall in the Navy right now. Should something happen, should they need tugs and salvage vessels, they don't have full coverage around the planet right now. And I think what we saw with Ever Given going ashore in the Suez is you need salvage vessels. And when you need them, you need them close by. You don't need them to take too long to get there. Subtenders, these are also hybrid man. They're commanded by a Navy 06, a captain, but they have civilian crews on board, the Frank Cable and the Emory S. Land. Uh, even though they're listed as submarine tenders, they're kind of jack of all trade tenders. They do a lot of work, but they too are getting long in the tooth. These are vessels that are they're really getting old and need to be replaced. Fleet Ocean Tugs, uh, again, as I mentioned before, we have two salvage vessels, three Fleet Ocean Tugs. These are all part of the replacement program. Eight salvage vessels are coming in, going to replace the Fleet Ocean Tugs and replace the uh, uh, salvage vessels. Uh, these vessels provide emergency towing. They also do a lot of, of jack-of-all-trade work with dive teams, with uh, EOD teams. They can uh, support mine warfare. They can support salvage, uh, uh, submarine operations, you name it. Uh, big, huge aft deck, a lot of power, cranes, winches, you name it, uh, really have a lot of capability. Uh, finally, there's a series of vessels called Submarine Special Warfare Support Ops that are out there. Uh, these vessels support the, uh, the U.S. Navy's uh, submarine operations, rescue. For example, there used to be very specific submarine rescue vessels. They don't exist anymore. So instead, the U.S. charters commercial vessels for this. You also have vessels that are chartered that operate with the, um, the uh, 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 special operations guys. So I always want to highlight this because I think this is, this is an interesting issue here. I'm going to come back to the chart here. So if you look into this, the fleet special and uh, support and special missions, there's a ship missing here. There's a ship that's not on here, hasn't been on here at all. And matter of fact, it's this ship right here. So I wrote this piece back in 2017 on what I call the ultimate stealth vessel. And the ultimate stealth vessel of all time is this vessel, the motor vessel Ocean Trader. She was the Craigside. She's operated by Maersk now, but she's been converted into a special operations platform. See if I got an image of it here for you. Let me pull up an image for you. So this is an image from Warship Cam that caught the Ocean Trader coming out of Norfolk uh, this past month. And matter of fact, I got a note from them asking me if I knew what ship that was. And I knew exactly what ship it was because I'd written about it. And the ship was not showing an AIS. She was not showing uh, up on any of the tracking features, which was interesting to me because this vessel was going off contract. She'd been on contract for five years. And uh, in March, she was off contract. And it looks like she's back on contract because leaving Norfolk, Virginia, she had uh, no AIS going. Uh, no markings on her. Uh, she's not showing a name. She's not showing anything. And this is the conversion of her. This is her as the Craigside, the bottom here. And this is her as Ocean Trader right up here. She's operated by Maersk Lines. You'll see up here forward of the house, a twin hangar deck was fitted here along the side of the vessel where the row row deck was. She has basically a, a launching capability for small craft for vessels. 
Uh, come back here to the other image. She's got a flight deck on the stern. She's got a stern ramp right here. Uh, she has a lot of capabilities here, this vessel. She also has the ability to launch drones, UAVs, you name it. Uh, I think this is the type of vessel that we should be investing more money in, 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 in terms of, of development. Uh, I think we should be building rows just like this, like crazy in the United States. Uh, commercial rowers like this, this commercial rowers like this can be used for commercial service. They can be used as replacements for those aging maritime prepositioning ships. They can be used to recapitalize the aging sea lift fleet, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But more importantly, they can be used for missions uh, like this, where they can go out in very much ways. She's very similar, if I come back here on this, to this expeditionary support base. But this expeditionary support base is big. It's 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 gray. It's advertised. You know who it is. You know where it is. Whereas Ocean Trader basically sails under the radar, and you never see her. And by the way, she's never been listed on MSC's annual report in in those pictures at all. But she does show up on contracts. So that that's how we know she exists. Uh, the other vessels that the MSC operates under this. Real quick to close up this section. Command ship. She operates one command ship which is the uh, Mount Whitney, one of two command ships. It's interesting she, they, they operate one of the two. The Blue Ridge isn't under them, but Mount Whitney is, and, and I'm not sure why that is. The other vessels that aren't here that you see is, is uh, Harbor Tugs. MSC has contracts for Harbor Tugs, even though they're not listed on the, the, the spreadsheet here. Uh, they run, they say here, 11 Harbor Tug time charters and eight Harbor Tug call-out services so that they can be used in harbors throughout the United States. Very important uh, uh, priority to have those harbor tugs to help Navy vessels in and out, out of their berths. The last one under fleet support and special missions are some of my favorite ships, even though they're, they're very controversial, are these. These are what's called the EPFs, fast transport ships. They're basically modified uh, Austal catamarans. Uh, Austal, which is a shipping firm out of Australia, builds these high-speed catamarans. Uh, this type of vessel was tested by the Australians uh, with the Jervis Bay, the United States uh, tested this with a, uh, a different variety of these vessels, and the decision was made to build these vessels, and they've been built. Uh, absolutely fantastic vessels, fast, high speed. You can do a lot of things with them. The problem is the Navy has not been crazy about them because they don't like them stealing missions from other Navy vessels, in my opinion. They really don't, the, and, and in many ways, that's an issue with them. Uh, you'll see them. They got this ramp on them. They got the capability to carry gear on board. Right now, there's plans for 14 of them uh, to be built with a potential for a 15th one uh, to be built. It looks like right now there, there's a couple of interesting options with them. Let me pull up the list of vessels here for you. So there you go. The, the 12 of them are listed right there. You see the 12 that are being uh, built right there. 13th the, uh, uh, is coming out here, the Apalachicola. Uh, she's going to be a different one because the plans were initially for Apalachicola and Cody 13 and 14 to be modified into small medical vessels, kind of like uh, hospital ships, but small hospital ships. But uh, it looks like that's changing. It looks like now the Apalachicola is going to be modified into an unmanned vessel for, for testing purposes, whereas Cody and, and a new EPF 15 will become the hospital ship variations with them. These ships are spread around the, the planet operating. They do a whole variety of different work. Uh, got a flight deck. They got a, a row row deck on board. They got the capability to carry up to a battalion of troops for a limited period of time. Actually, uh, no, battalion, excuse me, uh, about 300 Marines on board. So it's at a big heavy company probably on board for you know a, a brief period of time. They can house about 100 on board for an extended period of time. Absolutely just a jack of all trade type vessels. Uh, of course, they're limited armament on board, limited uh, defense capability on board, just really small weapons on board, but have the ability at high speed to get places. And unlike vessels like the, uh, the the LCSs, especially the Freedom class, these vessels work really well. They've, they've been absolutely demonstrating their capabilities here. All right, that brings us to the last group, which is the combat uh, command support. And this includes really two large groups. One is what's called surge sea lift. And this is the sea lift capability that the military sea lift command possesses. These are large roll on roll off ships. They actually had 15 of these. They don't have that many anymore. They're down to 13 now. Two of them have been basically laid up. 
uh, and the remaining uh, vessels they have are all slated to go over to the Maritime Administration over the next year or two. Uh, they'll be phasing them out. Uh, Ten of them are these large medium speed rowers like this, like Ben Viendez right up here. You can see these are huge vessels, 950 feet long, 300,000 square feet of cargo, a lot of capability on these vessels. Uh, there's 10 of those. And then there's three former uh, maritime pre-positioning ships that are getting close to being at, at the end of their service life. And they're probably going to be phased out. The other element in here is the Army prepositioning program. The Army maintains a prepositioning program just like the Navy does, although they keep it separate. Why? I don't know. Don't ask me. But they do. So these are the 15 right here that were in the surge fleet. The Martin and the Wheat had now been transferred out. They're no longer there. The Cossack, the Overgon, the Pless were former maritime prepositioning ships. This is one of them right here. Actually, this is the Fisher, excuse me. Uh, and they're going to be phased out. And then these 10 large medium speed row rows right here, these were all built after the Persian Gulf War. They're going to head over to Marad within the next year or two. Add to it, these vessels, these five, actually, it's going to be six now. There's actually six of them that are going to be out there. Large, medium speed row rows. These are the Army prepositioning program. Used to be eight of them. Then they went down to five. Now they're back up to six again. Uh, they maintain vessels out there, three in Diego Garcia, three over in uh, Western Pacific. They also have two container ships, the Page and the Carter. Uh, One's in the Far East, the Page is in, uh, I think, in Diego, the Carter's over in the Far East. And then the Air Force maintains two vessels, the Line and the Fisher. They also came, they're basically packed to the gills with ammunition. And so should the Air Force get into a bombing campaign and they need bombs, bullets, and all other equipment out there, they can offload these vessels. We've seen that done before in conflict. Finally, there's the basically dry cargo and wet cargo. MSC will periodically charter vessels specifically for operations. They will get them either from the commercial fleet or the ready reserve force and use them for specific missions. So, for example, supporting Diego Garcia, they have a vessel, since there's no vessel that sails from Singapore directly to Diego Garcia, except for a government vessel, they charter a vessel, in this case, the SLNNC Corsica does that. And you'll see that vessel moving between them. Uh, you'll also see uh, vessels used for uh, the resupply of McMurdo Station, in that which case you need a ice strengthened vessel to do that. So you get a vessel like the Maersk Valencia. That's one of the uh, vessels that's used up in the Baltic uh, to deliver cargo in the ice areas. So you'll see her down there. Same thing in the tanker office. This is an area I think the MSC really needs to think about expanding is the number of tankers they have. We saw that with the shutdown of the pipeline. We've seen it with the wear and tear on the MSC oiler fleet. Right now they have basically three the Empire State, the Evergreen State, which are under long-term charter, the Maersk Perry, which is an ice-strengthened tanker used again down to McMurdo Station. Here you see her in the ice right there. And then the SLNC PAX and Goodwill operate short, basically shallow draft tankers over in the Far East. Well, that's it. That's the MSC fleet as it exists today and its capabilities and, and basically the missions it executes around the world. This is obviously going to be changing. Uh, we're going to see added here to the fleet oilers, those Kaiser class Ka vessels are going to go away, replaced by the new uh, John Lewis class. Uh, we're going to see basically the phase out here over in the uh, sea lift area where these vessels, again, the, the Martin's gone, the wheat's actually already gone. And then we're going to see the transition of these surge sea lift vessels over to the ready reserve force. We'll see these fleet tugs and, and salvage vessels be swapped out for the newer vessels as they come out, the new ATS, the Navajo class, as they come out in, into service, we'll see the expansion of the, uh, of the fast transports as more and more of them uh, come out. We'll see new sonar surveillance vessels coming out, additional oceanographic survey vessels coming out, new uh, cable repair vessel coming out. So a, a very interesting fleet. It's not as sexy as a cruiser and destroyer and an aircraft carrier and a submarine and an amphib, but all of these play a vital role. And they go in harm's way to support the, the military on a consistent basis. And so this Memorial Day, it's always uh, really important, especially during COVID, when many of these mariners were stuck on board, couldn't get off vessels for very long periods of time, to think about the role that they play in supporting the national defense of the United States. So I hope you liked the video. If you do, please subscribe to the channel. Give it a thumbs up. 
hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos. Please share it for this Memorial Day. Let people know about what the Merchant Marine, especially the American Merchant Marine and Military Sea Lift Command does. And tune in for the next episode, which will look at the Merchant Marine during World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War, when merchant mariners gave their lives in defense of the nation. So this is Sal signing off. Thanks.